Well, good evening, everybody. It is time. It is past time. I'm, I'm, I'm two minutes past time, so y'all don't hold that against me at the end. If I go two minutes after, then you know I started two minutes late. What a joy to have all of you here tonight. Good to have you watching from home. Hope and pray that uh, you're all's well. I don't know, maybe Tom and Linda or, or Jewel and, and, and Paul. I don't know, Sherry, Miss Cl whoever's watching. I hope and pray God will bless you in a big way tonight. It's good to have all of you in the room with us tonight. I tell you what, Miss Candy is eating up this extra sunshine in the evenings. Now she is, she is, she is enjoying life. Like she's out there sunning herself all ago, like an old groundhog or a possum or something out there in the sun, and just soaking up some vitamin C. And I'm sure she would appreciate you. Well, I, I'd say that if she's in the room. I ain't, I ain't scared of her. I, I, I didn't call her a possum. I said she's she's basking like a possum, like I said. Era. Groundhog. <laughs> groundhog. That's what I said. Groundhog. Hey, you don't get me in trouble. That's, that's enough of that foolishness. Yeah, like a cat. Laying like a cat. That's what we'll go with. But it is good to be in the house of the Lord on this beautiful evening as we just, uh, just a glorious time of the year. Uh, spring is ever budding and, and, and daffodils. We got a bunch of daffodils on our table from somewhere. I don't know where they came from. It just came from Nancy's house. It's just so beautiful. And, uh, a lot, of, a lot to be thankful for. I mean, God's been awful good to us and blessed and provided and protected. We prayed for the ladies all day. They've gone all day and, and half the afternoon. They, they, they claimed they went to Hamrick. They brought some Hamrick's receipts back, but where else they wound up, I have, I'm not even going to get to, under, to even guess. But I know a good time was had by all. Miss Jude brought her friend. I hope, her, hope your friend had a good time. Well, she said, I just left all these women. Well, praise the Lord. Are they, are they looking for a church? Are they church going forward? Yeah, yeah, boy. They stay on. Stay on. Sick them, Judy. Sick them, Judy. Amen. I'm so proud to see that new face this morning. Tammy said she fit right in. Said just, she just did. Like, yes, she yeah. did. That's all right. That's all right. But we got a lot to be praying for. A lot of, a lot of folks still uh, sick in body. A lot, of, a lot of folks just battling stuff. Nikki was telling me she's got some other stuff going on in her body right now. Some tests that Way to get some results back, so we'll continue to pray for her and all that's going on in her life. Um, of course, uh, Brother Steve, what, 26, he's going to be joining that new knee club. We'll start having a little, little support group while he boys with their new knees. Uh, so that, that reminds me to pray for Mark Newman. Uh, Miss Pam was here this morning to tell me that Brother Mike is just having off just a lot of pain in his knees. He just can't get comfortable up one of the floors half the night, just can't sleep. And, uh, just, just keep old Mark or Mike in your prayers. And also, Mark. Had a good visit with Mark Newman yesterday, and he, he met me at the door and no cane and be bopping around like nobody's business. So Mark's doing real good as well. Also some, some lingering pain, he told me, but all in all, doing extra good. And he, he was giving God the glory and praise for that. Hey, John, he made us an offer. He tried to stretch me and take a cat home with us. If you're looking for another cat, no, uh, no, 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 I, I know for a fact that I, I know where I can find you three or four. So just let me know. I've got something here for you. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. Would there be others not? Ronnie, Mama feeling a little bit better? No, she's a little bit puny yesterday. She said they ain't feeling no count today. So pray for Miss Miller. She, she just don't feel good. Uh, had a good visit with her yesterday. Um, what else? What else? That was Mike Douthat that you were talking about. Mike Douthat in his knee. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, Pam also reminded me this morning. I, I, did, I knew it was coming up pretty soon, but she, she told me that Gun Doggy was in over the weekend, and old Gunnar Barker, and, and he's facing a nine month deployment. Uh, with with the Navy, and uh, she said, and uh, hopefully she might be maybe just a little bit missed up on her dates, but she said we'll not see him again until after that nine month performance over. I don't know when he leaves, but I'm hoping that maybe he'll maybe slip back in here one time before he has to go. But if not, uh, keep old Gunner in your prayers. Uh, the, the, the location, the destination is a little up in the air right now as to where they're going, but it's a nine month deployment on board a Navy ship, so 
Marines on board Navy ships. That's been going on since since forever. So uh, I, I'm anxious to hear the stories you might bring back from that. So keep uh, keep old Gunner in your prayers. Of course, Isaac and all those military boys and girls, men and women that are faithfully serving all around the world. Brother, but Brother Bob, Brother Bob had a good day. Okay, man, okay, man. Keep, keep old Bob in your prayers. Just a lot, a lot of folks, just a lot of stuff going on. How about your mama, Miss, Miss Cindy? She, your mom doing okay? That's all right. Well, good, good, good. All right. Well, let's pray. We'll get into this this good study tonight. If it goes anything like it did at 9 o'clock this morning, I pray that God will bless it like it did. We had a good time here at the 9 o'clock service this morning. It's a good study, and I'm anxious to get back into it again. Father, I do praise you and give you glory uh, for every blessing that you poured into my life. God, overwhelmed uh, by your goodness. Uh, we're so unworthy. But you're, but you're so good to us, better than we could ever ever imagine. God, I thank you for healing. I thank you for protection and for provision. God, it comes in, in, in countless kind of ways. You're faithful to hear our cries and our prayers and answer our prayers. And we, we come before you tonight, Lord, just in standing in awe with our, with our hands lifted high in praise, thanking you for blessing us the way you do. I do thank you for watching over the ladies on their trip today. I thank you, Father, that they're... Our boys with their new knees are, are, are making progress. I thank you, Father, that you continue to strengthen those that have been under the weather and continue to provide the blessings of life, Lord, in, in ways that uh, are very tangible sometimes, very physical, uh, but sometimes it's emotional help, and sometimes it's a lifting of our spirit and, and everything in between. And for that, we're, we're, we're eternally grateful. But I do look before you, Lord, tonight. So many, God, that are standing in the need of prayer uh, God, we, we think of many, Lord, that are that are represented in this very room here tonight, Lord. And we think of, of, of Mr. Bob Tibble and pray continue blessing, Lord, upon him. And, Lord, I know Miss Rena and, and her, her and Steve have got a lot going on in their lives, Lord. And I, I pray, God, that you'll just bless all the, the doctor's visits and, and appointments that, that each of them are, are going through. And, and, God, I think of, um, of Ronnie and, and Miss Sandy, God, they're, and they're uh, taking care of their moms. I pray, God, you just bless each of those dear ladies. And God, bless these young as God, as they take care of their mom. God, I thank you for their willingness and, and their commitment, Lord, to, to do what you've called us to do, to honor our fathers and mothers, reminding us, Lord, that it's more it's more than just the way we act. Lord, we honor them in a whole lot of ways, and I, and I thank you, God, for that. Lord, and thinking about mamas makes me think of, of Scotty's mom and Miss Kathy is facing her surgery you know, just in a few days. I pray, oh God, for a blessing in that procedure. Lord, the doctor don't seem to be giving a whole lot of hope but, God, we know that you're able. We know that you're still in charge, still in control. We will lean heavy, God, into your provision and ask you, God, to bless them in a mighty, mighty way. Miss Kathy Davis, Lord, and her heart could get uh, squared away and she could get back, Lord, enjoying life again. I pray for Mike and Paula Waterhouse, Lord, all that's going on with them. I pray for our country, Lord, our leadership from the top to the bottom. Again, Lord, you know my prayer list. That is written down. and uh, God, the sum has not ever made it onto a piece of paper. Things have been shared in confidence and I pray, oh God, that you move in a mighty, mighty way. Lord, in each of those worries and each of those concerns that your people are bearing up under great burdens of life. God, I pray a blessing upon this Bible study. I pray for our kids in action. All that's going on over to spot. Every part of our ministries here tonight, I pray you'll be right in the midst of it all. That your name is glorified above all else. That your people will leave uh, these few moments together looking back and say, surely it was good to have been in the house of the Lord. And I will gladly and eternally give you praise for it all. For we ask it humbly in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 We're coming tonight to Joshua chapter number 7. And this will be our final uh, study. I, I kind of loosely entitled it uh, Lessons from the Battlefield. Uh, it's kind of a culmination of, of, of a whole lot of stuff that we've learned about. But it's going to focus primarily uh, on, on chapter number 7 of, of, of the book of Joshua. And I'll tell you this while you're turning. We have two Wednesday nights between now and Easter. And uh, these two Wednesday nights are going to not be a series per se, but a couple of standalone studies. Uh, kind, of, uh, kind of Jesus' journey uh, on, on, from, from Jerusalem to Calvary. And uh, some things that goes along to kind of, kind of filling in some of the gaps uh, from our Sunday morning preaching. So... Starting next Wednesday night, we'll, we'll, we'll be turning, turning our hearts and minds towards Easter uh, like we are on Sunday mornings. But if you remember anything about where we are in this study, uh, I, mean, I know they've gone two, two Wednesday nights. And by the way, thank you, David, for stepping in. I've heard some good things about David's uh, studies that he led. Uh, I, 
I have to, I have to get there sometime when I'm actually here. So I can, I, I love to hear it sometime too. Yeah. I appreciate Dave stepping in those two Wednesday nights and, and, um, and filling in for me. But uh, Joshua chapter 7 comes right after Joshua chapter 6. Well, that's kind of a stupid thing to say. Where else, where else would it come? That didn't, that didn't come out right at all. But Joshua chapter 6 ends on a, on a really high note. If you used to turn back and just kind of let your eyes fall on some of the verses, if you've got a study Bible, it's probably got some kind of a paragraph header at the top of Joshua chapter 6. But you should remember that we find Israel here in chapter 7 right on the hills of what some would argue was the greatest military conquest, not definitely in Israel's history, but perhaps in all of world history. Uh, they, they have just witnessed God's tremendous power on display as they watched the walls around that mighty city of Jericho crumble uh, with, without them even having to lay their hands on it. So with that still looming large in their memories, they're, they're basking in the glow of that great event, how God moved. They, they thought the Jordan River was pretty amazing. Then they watched him do what he did at Jericho. So these people without a doubt are thinking, what's God got in store for us next, you would think. But Joshua chapter 7 opens on a rather negative note. Even after this great victory at Jericho, it, chapter 7 opens with God being upset yet again with the actions of his chosen people. Listen now, it starts. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1 says, But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. And we'll stop right there. We'll come back to chapter verse 2 in just a minute. But you need to understand what Achan has done. Uh, and, and to fully appreciate what Achan has done, you've got to come back to chapter 6. Uh, you may have to turn a page. You don't have to you know how big your Bible is. You may have to turn the page. Why don't you look at verse 17 of Joshua chapter 6, where the Bible says, The city shall be under the ban, and in and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. But all the silver and the gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Very, very precise, very succinct. Uh, instructions here with no stab, stammering, no stuttering. The word translated in the New American Standard here as under the ban in the King James Version says accursed. And it's the same word actually that you find in verse number 21. New American Standard calls it they utterly destroyed everything in the city. So it's really the, the same word and that word means to, to, to ban or to destroy but it also can mean to devote in the sense of something belonging to God. So God's instructions here are very, very clear. Jericho was to be completely devoted to him as the first fruits of Canaan. This is their first conquering battle. This is their first uh, victory. So God is saying this is going to be a sacrifice. All that belongs there. Verse number 18 says that no treasure was to be kept by the people. Very, very specific, very precise. So with those clear and precise restrictions in mind, we read in chapter 7, verse number 1, that's just exactly what Achan did. And that's what causes God to be angry with Israel. Undoubtedly, I, I, I think I can say this with complete confidence, Israel probably thinks that everything is, is hunky-dory, as one old word phrase used to be that we use sometimes. They're even thinking perhaps that they're standing on the edge of this great string of victory. We've seen what happened at the Jordan River, what God did there. Then we thought that was pretty awesome. Look what he did at Jericho. This is only a taste. Can you imagine what God did at Jericho? Imagine what he's going to do for us next. So they're anxiously waiting to see what God has in store. What they didn't know is there's a problem in the camp. There's sin <laughs> in the camp. Look at chapter two or chapter seven, verse two. Now Joshua 
sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Haven, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to Ai. Don't make all the people toil up there, for they are few. A bunch of spies are about to eat the words. But from these verses, we find out that, that Israel has become an overly confident people. I mean, Israel might have had reason to be confident based on what they've seen God do. But upon closer examination, I'm going to point this out to you as this, as this narrative unfolds for us tonight, it becomes pretty apparent, pretty clear, that their confidence is misplaced. See, they're still reveling in what God's done at Jericho. So they're on this, this emotional high. So Israel then looks at Ai, and they believe that this little town is going to pose no problem for us whatsoever. Verse 3, as we read there, the spies actually suggested, there's no need to send a whole army. Pick you out two or 3,000 soldiers. That's probably all we'll need for that little sleeping little hamlet that's, that is Ai. Israel didn't know it yet, but they're living through one of the most dangerous spiritual times of life. I'm talking about the time just after we experience a great spiritual victory in our life. And, I, and I've seen it oftentimes when, when our young people come back from a student conference or you come back from a women's conference or a, a church after a, a revival that has swept through the community and everybody is just on a spiritual cloud and, and on a spiritual high. And just like Israel, we have this tendency to become a little overconfident. We, we, we believe that we can handle any battle that comes our way. We're, 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 we're spiritually charged and ready to take on hell with a water pistol, as the old saying goes. Now, now, now let me stop right here. Don't, don't misunderstand me right here. Confidence is a good thing. We, we, we have been made more than conquerors, the Bible tells us. We have won the victory. Over, I mean, the, the confidence is not a bad thing as long as our confidence is in the right place. As long as we're walking with hope and confidence fully in the power of the Lord, and the promises of his word and, and the strength of the Holy Spirit of God, we're going to win a lot of victories. And we can walk in that confidence. Psalm 37, verse 4, he says, The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them. Why? Because they trust in him. So it's okay to have confidence. I'm not saying that's not. It's when we begin walking in our own ability. It's when we begin walking in our own fleshly abilities that we're destined to trip and stumble. Proverbs 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before the destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. So I, 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 every time I've had an opportunity to teach this passage of Scripture, it, it washes over me and, and, and just convicts me huge. Because I fully recognize how God has gifted me. And I, I, I can put together a Bible study. And I can put together three points in a poem. And, and, I've, and I've conquered my fear of public speaking. And I can stand up before a big crowd and I can put some music together. I've got some skills that God has blessed me with. And it's awful easy to just rest in those abilities and in those skills. But this story, every time I come to it, reminds me how quick we can get so overcome without the leadership and the power of God. And I want to show you what happens to these people. If we're not real careful, it can also happen to us. So it's because they are an overly confident people that we see them quickly becoming a conquered people. Look at verse 4 now. After the, after the recommendation of verse number 3, don't let them all go up there, two or 3,000. Don't make all the people go up there and toil, what verse 3 says. So, verse 4 begins, about 3,000 men from the people went up there but they fled from the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck them about 36, struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent so the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So Israel goes up to Ai on the recommendation of those spies, takes them two or 3,000 men. 
and they get their hind side waxed, so to speak. They get their backsides spanked. They suffer a terrible defeat at the hands of the Ai residents, and 36 of their own men are killed. So think how devastating this had to be been to the Israelites. They've just watched God destroy Jericho for them. They've just watched him bring down the walls of Jericho without him having to raise a, a single battering ram or a sledgehammer or nothing. So they're walking into Ai thinking, if he could do that in Jericho, just think what's going to happen in Ai. So they go from this spiritual plateau, this cloud land, this place they're living in great spiritual victory to boom. How devastating it was to these men. They're carrying their dead back with their tails between their legs. But on close inspection, you can actually see a couple mistakes these folks made. And I think it's mistakes that we can all be guilty of. I think it's mistakes that, we, that, we, that we've all been guilty of and will continue to be guilty if we're not extra careful. Remember this now. Remember the last two great events in their history as recorded in God's Word. Crossing of the flooded Jordan River, the destruction of the mighty city of Jericho. And both of those events had one thing in common. Remember what it was? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them and, and, and walked into the Jordan River first. As soon as the feet of the priest that was carrying the Ark of the Covenant touched the water, the water stopped, flowed away, and the ground became dry for them to cross the flooded Jordan River. When they marched around the city of Jericho those six days, seven times on the seventh day, the Ark of the Covenant out ahead of them. You need to remember, we talked about this in that, in that last time in our last study about, about the Battle of Jericho, the Ark always symbolized the presence and the power of God in the presence of the people. Without it, without it leading them into battle, says only one thing. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. They, they went into this battle in their own ability. They went into this battle in their own strength, and people died as a result. Now listen, if I try to live this Christian life, if you try to live that Christian life, if I, if I try to pastor this church, you try to to be the husband or the wife or the nene or whatever they call you. And if you try to do all those grandkids and you try to live this life, it's my brother driving me bananas. That's what you're saying, Dustin. It needs to be adjusted. It ain't, it ain't right. We've got to work on this thing some more. If we try to live this life, fight this battles and fight this fleshly tendency and the fleshly desires in our own power, we're going to face plant spiritually every single time. But there's something glorious in the fact that when I'm walking with the Lord and walking in his word and, and, and praying and, and being plugged in, he'll go with us into battle and he'll face our enemies on our behalf. And this is not a new lesson. David would go on to, to, to know this about his own life. You remember 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47, David's standing there facing nine and a half foot tall Goliath, that mighty soldier, mighty man. And he said this, David said, he said, All this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So for these folks to get to this place where they did not put the Ark of the Covenant out front of them, they are in essence, by their actions, putting the confidence in their own abilities and not in the Lord. Take you two or three thousand souls, you'll be fine. It's just AI. They weren't walking by faith. They were walking by sight. And they were guilty of trusting what they thought they could do by themselves. Now, let's just be honest right here. There ain't nobody here but us. Let's just be honest with our own self right here. I don't want no show of hands, nothing like that. But think back about your own life and ask yourself, how many times have, have, have I stumbled or, or suffered a defeat in my spiritual life and, and, and had the props knocked out from under me because I, I discovered that we can handle this thing by ourselves. Oh yeah, it's a financial problem. We, we, got, we got enough. We, we can take care of this and we'll fix we'll leave the big stuff to the Lord and we'll take care of the smaller stuff as, as the needs arise. We're all been guilty of that. I promise you, this I can only speak for this guy. But there's been times that we felt that way in my own life. 
And I had to come to, to, the, to, the, to the stark realization numerous times. I'm not up to this task by myself. I don't have nearly enough in the tank to do what it is that God's called me to do and to be, and neither do any of us. For me to know and enjoy spiritual victory, what we titled this, this whole study, if I'm going to know spiritual victory in 2024, it's going to require me to only move forward in accordance with his leadership. And lean heavy into verses like Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So Israel was a confident people who became a conquered people. And don't you notice the last phrase of verse number five, and just to keep those C's kind of going, I, I chose the word confounded. They were a confident people, a conquered people, and as a result, they become a confounded people. Look at verse five, the last phrase. The hearts of the people melted and became as water. Do you remember that, does that phrase ring at all familiar from this previous verses in this study? When, when, when describing the people of Jericho, Joshua uses the same words used by Rahab, actually. He pulls a phrase back in Joshua chapter 2, verse number 9, Rahab told those spies, he said, listen, she said, listen, we, we knew y'all was coming, we had heard how the power of God was moving on y'all. We'd heard what you had done to them as kings and this mighty army bearing down on Jericho. And she said, we heard about that. Rahab said about the people of Jericho, the hearts of the people melted in fear. And now we're seeing that exact same phrase used here. God's people are feeling the same fear that God's enemy had once experienced. The roles have been flip-flopped. And what we begin to see right there is one of the greatest problems that's brought on by sin in the life of God's people. Sin will defeat you and leave you feeling powerless. Nothing seems right in the heart or the life of a believer when sin is in the midst. When there's unconfessed sin in the life of a child of God, this chapter becomes very, very, very poignant. Have you ever had a time like that? Have you ever had a time in your spiritual life when, when, you, when you, you was harboring ill will against somebody or jealousy or envy or spite against somebody? And I promise you, it'll rob you of joy. It'll rob you of victory. It'll rob you of peace. I'm reminded of a, of a, of a series of books written by John uh, Frank Peretti called This Present Darkness and Piercing the Darkness. And it's all about angels and demons and spiritual warfare and in this book the demons and the angels are fighting the demons can see and angels can see each other but it talks about the people and the people can't see the demons or or the or the or the, or the angels but they're impacted by that battle by that struggle and one of those very beautiful pictures he paints in that story is all these people coming into this little church to worship and the angels are sitting there watching these people walk in this church and he's describing them with, with demons of, of, of sitting on their shoulders with deep claws into their brain. There's a, there goes the demon of envy and the demon of jealousy and lust. And these, they're just carrying the demons right into church and sitting down there expecting God to bless them. Unconfessed sin left too long in the lives of God's people can impact everything around us. Now I want you to remember at this point right here, at this particular moment, Israel doesn't even know there's a problem. Hmm? At this particular moment, all they're seeing is the service. All they can see is what they see that the army coming back, they're carrying 36 dead soldiers with them. They've got wounds and, and battle scars of every variety. They've just suffered their first defeat. So all they know is what's right there before them. God realizes that they're not getting it. God understands that these boys, they don't understand the mess that they're in. So I want you to watch now, as the rest of this chapter unfolds, I want you to watch as God takes the necessary steps to reveal to the nation of Israel just exactly what the problem was. So we're going to see this painful defeat that they've just experienced is quickly going to give way to an even more painful discovery. Let's read verses 6 through 9 now. So Joshua tore his clothes 
and fell down to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, and they're going to surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? Again, a very poignant chapter, another part of this chapter that convicts my heart every time I read it. And I, this particular passage, especially verses 6 through 9, because I see here the man of God who's been put in charge over these people of God to lead them having a crisis of faith kind of moment. Joshua has he's fallen his face before God. After this tragic military defeat, we find Joshua on his face before the Lord in prayer. And it's very, very clear that his prayer is coming from a broken heart. But even in the brokenness of his heart, there's also a hint of anger and even some accusation. You can almost see Joshua shaking his fist at God, pointing at God. Why, why did you bring us out of here? We'd been better off if we stayed on the other side of the Jordan. Why are you doing this to us? Joshua offers us a, a really, really good example of God's people realizing that prayer is the best and only recourse in times of trouble. Take that away from it first. That needs to be our go-to. Not when everything else, we try everything else, so I guess we don't try and pray. Not, this needs to be our first response. But at the same time, unbeknownst to him, Joshua's also about to learn that prayer will avail nothing no thing until sin has been dealt with. Again, going back to David as an example, David learned that same lesson the hard way. He even prompted him to write it in, in Psalm 66 and verse 18. He says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not even hear me. Joshua can understand why Israel is powerless in battle. Help me understand, he's saying. Why did you bring this people over the Jordan River to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Let me, let me just point out something right here. As he's trying to understand why Israel is powerless in his battle, let me, let me first tell you what the answer was. The, the answer was not to blame God, first of all. The answer is not to dispute the plan of God or the will of God. The answer is going to come very clear in just a minute. The answer is right there in the camp all along. When we make life-altering decisions that bring terrible consequences on our lives, it's too late to try to play the blame game. You know, if, 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 if I've made conscious choices in my life and I'm now having to reap the repercussions, there's no need to point fingers at somebody else. It's never the right time to accuse anybody, and it's certainly not the right time to accuse God of anything. When a tragedy befalls our lives, we need to stop very quickly and ask God, what am I trying to, what are you trying to teach me here? What am I supposed to learn? And look within first and see if there's a problem there that God's trying to, to bring to the, to the spotlight. When there's a lack of power in my life, when I feel like my prayers are not leaving the room that I'm praying in, it's bouncing off the ceiling. When the problem, you know, my, my, my Bible reading is not touching my heart, when I've got all these spiritual blocks in my life, you trust the preacher when I tell you that the problem ain't with God. The problem's not with other people. You got to start right here. The problem's no number one. There's some stuff we're going to have to confess and get rid of. Let's continue. Verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, the New American Standard says, Rise up. I like what King James says. Get up. I, mean, I can just hear the, 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 the love. Would you please? Get up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they've, ever take, they've even taken some of the things under the ban and have, not, and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they've also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before the enemies. 
They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have been accursed, become accursed. I'll not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Rise up. Get up, Joshua, he says. Consecrate the people and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, There are things under the ban in your midst. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban or the cursed, those things from your midst. In the morning, then you shall come near by your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes by lot shall come near by families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come near by man by man. It shall be that the one who is taken with the things under the ban shall be burned with fire. He and all that belongs to him, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has committed a disgraceful thing in Israel. Now, you have to picture this. I, I'm seeing Joshua. This, this is this is pulling his ears, pulling his ears back. He's like, wait, what? <laughs> Joshua and Israel trying to figure out what the devil's going on and why this is happening in their camp. God in heaven already knows. Make sure you make sure you nail down that fact early on. God in heaven already knows, and now begins to tell Joshua about it. God quickly tells Joshua. You know, in, in, in the simplest form of all those verses I just read, it boils down to this, Joshua, there's sin in the camp. Verse 12, he tells him, God, God tells Joshua, that, that's what's hindering the power. It's that sin that's bringing about that defeat. The sons of Israel can't stand before their enemies. They, they turn their backs before their enemies. Why? Because they've become accursed. I'll not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Then he goes on in verse 14 through 14 to 15 and tells Joshua, here's how you're going to do it. Here, here, here's how we're going to discover who the guilty party is. Quite often, the greatest spiritual problems faced by Christian people today comes from within and not from without. I remember an old adage from, from the Navy that they used to use a lot, but it, but it fits in a lot of spiritual truths as well. Water on the outside of the boat causes little problems. It's when the water gets inside the boat. That's when you got all sorts of trouble. If the water stays outside where it belongs, smooth sailing. It's when the water starts to get inside the boat. All sorts of trouble ensues. And when there are spiritual defeats in my own life, you rest assured. And, and the Bible, Bible will back this up. That, that the things that we try to blame are, are raising on or try to blame this world on or try to blame society on stems right out of the heart of man. The broken nature, the sinful heart of every one of us. So, so they experience this painful defeat. And it leads to that painful discovery. And it all culminates in a, in a painful death. Check out this, <coughs> check out this gruesome ending. Verse 16. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near by tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. Let me, let me stop right there. Casting lots, I, I've seen several different, read several different translations of what casting lots actually looks like. Uh, some some bones, and it's, it's like dice, and there's, there's variations on what that could have looked like, but there was, it was a, a way of God directing, and that's how they did it. According to, to verse number 14, the Lord takes by lot and shall come by family. So anyway... As it turns out, verse 16 says that the tribe of Judah is taken first. So we whittled it down to Judah. He brought the family of Judah near, and he took the family of the Zerahites. And he brought the family of the Zerahites near, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. He brought his household near, man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. So boom, boom, boom. We've narrowed it down. All the nation of Israel... Tribe of Judah, one family, one man. Verse 19, Joshua says to that one man, he says to Achan, my son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you've done. Don't hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver, 
and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. Then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. They took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the sons of Israel, and they poured them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, that the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought him up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones. They burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Wow. Can we all agree this is a pretty vivid, pretty gruesome illustration of Romans 6.23 that says the wages of sin is death. See, God knew all along who was guilty. So why didn't he, why didn't he tell Joshua? That's one thing I've I, 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 not quite got my brain wrapped around. Can we not all agree that, that, that God could have come to Joshua just as easy as, hey, hey, man, here's the problem. you got sin in the camp. That boy Aiken over yonder, in the back left corner of his tent, underneath his sleeping bag, buried under the dirt, there's a, there's a mantle and there's gold and silver. There's your problem, pal. There's your problem. Deal with that right. Could, yeah, God could have done it easily. So why didn't he? I pondered that for a while. And I don't know exactly what I've come to except for this one conclusion. It's just, it's just, it's just my heart talking. I'm just wondering, could it, could it not have been perhaps that God in his love and compassion was, was given Aiken time to confess. You know, I, he, he knew how it was going to play out. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying he was hope, just hoping that Aiken would, would change the course of things. It's not that at all. But I've often wondered why it was that he, that he went about it the way that he did. But, but what, what this does remind us is, is that occasionally we need to all be reminded that God knows our sin. And his finger is getting closer and closer to the sins of our lives. And that ought, that ought to open our hearts and open our minds and realize that. It's only a matter of time till the finger of God lands on my life and I'm exposed in my sins. Because Numbers 32, 23 says it. Numbers 32, verse 23 says, you sin against the Lord and be sure that your sin will find you out. That sin, sin cannot and will not be hidden forever. So now that this sin is out in the open, it had to be dealt with. And, and with that, two key elements have to be noted here. There's compassion and then confession. Verse 19, Joshua speaks to Achan with all of the love in his heart and the compassion he can muster. He knows Achan's already condemned. He's already, he already knows. He's already known. God has already said it's going to happen. We'll, we'll narrow it down from the tribe to the family down to the man. He's already told him once we know what man it is, he knows in his mind Achan's condemned already, but he cares for him. He still cares for the man who had brought so much trouble to the nation of Israel. So then, sure enough, verse 20 and 21, he confesses to him. And I want you to notice the progression of Achan's sin in verse 21. There's three words, and I would submit to you tonight that sin follows this same pattern every single time. I saw, I coveted, I took. It may, be, it may translate differently depending on what, what version you're reading from tonight. I saw it. I wanted it. I took it. I saw it. I wanted it. I smoked it. Or I drunk it. Or I took it. Or I went to that website. And I, whatever, whatever sin looks like in your understanding of sin, it always follows the same pattern. I'll prove it to you. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1. In the Garden of Eden, Eve saw the fruit on the tree. It was pleasing to her eye. She took it. She saw it. She liked it. She took it. Going back to what we talked about Daniel or Samuel before. <laughs> David before in 2 Samuel. In his sin with Bathsheba. He's up on his balcony. Sees her taking a bath. He sees. He covets. He takes it. And again, I challenge you. Any, any sin you can think of will fit that same pattern. To the point that James writes about it. James writes this in James chapter 1 verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I've been tempted by God. 
God can't be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one that is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Sin always works the same way. It, you see it. It appeals to my fleshly tendency, my fleshly nature. I want it, so I take it. And what I find most disturbing about this whole account, about Achan, is that Achan had things buried in his tent that he couldn't even use. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Verse, verse 21, look at it again. When I saw the spoil, when I saw among the spoils or the stuff, and the spoil makes me think of uh, in pirate movies, they would call it booty. You know, that, that's the stuff that the, that the conquering army can lay claim to after a victory. In most victories, it was that way. Other times, even in the nation of Israel, they're going to storm these other cities and they're going to take all that stuff home with them. Not this time. That was not, that was not to be the model this time. God said, very specifically, chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, these things belong to me. They were not gifts for Israel. They were to be placed in the treasury of the Lord's house. So in essence, Achan is stealing from God. He is guilty of stealing from the Lord himself. And for him to benefit from what he had stolen would reveal his true character to the entire nation of Israel. If he was walking out of his tent wearing that mantle, somebody looked at that fabric and say, where'd you get that? Where'd you get where'd you, where'd you get fifty shekels of, of gold and hundred where'd you get all that silver? I know you, Aiken. You work the same place I work at. We're both shepherds, we work for them. Where'd you get that kind of, So he basically stole stuff that was no good to him whatsoever. He sinned and died for nothing. Hmm. As we've examined this Bible record of all this conquest of Israel, keeping in mind our, 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 our theme of, of knowing spiritual victory in 2024, I hope you've been able to see some parallels between the battles that Israel fought in the flesh, very real, tangible battles, compared to the battles that we all fight in the spirit. Because in the battles and the stories that we read, that we read related to the conquest of Canaan, I've tried to paint this comparison to our lives as children of God as we're striving to obtain our own spiritual victory. I want you to think back to about what we know about Jericho, and I want you to view Jericho as a type of the world. And think about how that in its defeat, in, this, in that story, we see the promise of victory over the world when we're putting God in the leadership position in our lives. First John chapter 5 tells us in verse 4, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So we see that illustrated in that story of Jericho. But now in Ai, I think we can view Ai as, as, as a type of the flesh. And if you continue on, and I would encourage you to read, read the rest of these accounts. If you go on into chapter 8, you're going to find that after the sin in the camp with Achan is dealt with, Israel goes back to Ai and conquers them in a, in, a, in a sound, sound fashion. And again, and I think in that defeat, if we want to view God's word as a spiritual book with spiritual truths, then we have the promise of victory in this flesh as we battle and do battle for the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 7, verse 24 says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But as we bring this to close, I, I share with you what I find to be the most unsettling fact of this whole account. The one that, 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 that drives me and, 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 and challenges me is the fact that the sin of one man could cause such problems for the entire family of God. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, Verse 24 said, God has composed the body, given more abundant honor to that member which lack, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. In verse 26, he says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, then all the members rejoice with it. 
Paul, Paul painted it there. He expounded this vision or this, this image of, of the body of Christ being like a human body with ears and noses and hands and, and feet. And I think that's a very clear illustration. I think I'm safe in saying that when one member of the body has problems, the entire body has problems. And you can, you can testify to that. If your foot hurts, the whole body limps. Every other muscle limps to make that foot feel better. You go right on. I mean, if, have you ever have you ever had your, had your thumb wrapped up in a big old bandage and realize how, how important your thumb is when you're not using that thumb? And whether you like it or not, your spiritual temperature can have a deep impact on the entire body of Christ. If you're God's child and you have unconfessed and unrepented sin in your heart and in your life you need to understand that that could prove to be a hindrance and trouble to those around you. Sin causes problems for the sinner, but it also causes problems for everybody else around them. Because the truth is, we're not an island unto ourselves. You may like to think you are, but the truth is, what you do affects your family. What you do affects your church, affects your community. Every child of God needs to grab onto the fact that God will chasten us to bring us back in line with his will. That there is help in Christ Jesus for every one of us that has an aching kind of heart. When we allow the sin of our lives to permeate and remain un undealt with, we try to hide that thing and try to cover up that thing, we're going to bring trouble to every corner of our lives. And the truth is, you may not want to admit it, but we're all aching from time to time. And when we are, our sin can bring some aching into our life. Horrible. That was a horrible pun. All through this series, we've made this comparison, contrasting and comparing the supernatural and the personal. There's been a supernatural part of these stories, but a very personal aspect in these, in these stories. And that's where we need to nail this thing down and walk out of here tonight facing the rest of this year, even with this theme, spiritual victories in 2024. If, this, if the story of Israel teaches us anything, let it be this, that there are battles that have to be fought, but they won't last forever. There's going to be hard times coming, but just as surely as Israel obtained a state of rest, one day we'll all know that rest as well. The day's coming. And all the battles will be over and we'll be in paradise with him forever. But in the meantime, there's enemies to face. There's battles to be fought. And it's up to us to make this choice. We can choose to fight them with our own weapons and of our own making and lose every time. Or we can fight the way the Lord has shown us and step out of the way and let him fight the battle for us. I don't know what you're fighting tonight. I, I, mean, I know some of your stories. I know there's some, some spiritual struggles going on in family dynamics. I get that. And even though I don't know all your stories, I do know a man. I know a man that can help you. I know the one who wants to help you with that battle. If, if I bring that to him and lay it at his feet and say, Lord, you're going to have to fix this. I don't know any other way to fix it. Joshua was a man of determination. Joshua was a man that would, we would all do well to emulate. And it's a quality that's developed by, that needs to be developed by every child of God. There's far too many quitting today. You know? There's far too many folks just dropping out of church, far too many throwing in the towel and, and giving up the fight. It may be, you, may, you may be shocked to know this, but I, I have resigned from this church probably no less than 20 times in the past 20 years. Tammy don't know a lot of them. Tammy, she's on a few of them. There's, there's been several times that I said, I'm done. And God said, no, you yeah, ain't. Yeah. In my mind, I was, I was, I was going to walk up here and say, yeah, it's time for me to go. I said, no, no, you're not. I said, okay. 20 years later, here we see it, Brother Roy. Here we, here we see it. And I think God's just looking for some folks that, that, that will just make a vow before the Lord. It says, come what may, I'll stand. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be one he can count on. I'll be in service until the bitter end. We need some folks that will adopt the attitude of Paul when he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, 
unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We've all had days. Don't, don't sit there in your high and mighty self-righteousness and tell me you've not had those kind of days. You just felt like dropping out. Been a whole lot easier. Don't quit. What you need to do is the same thing I've done numerous times. Just ask him, would you please, oh God, fan the dying embers back into a raging flame of victory for your glory. Blow a little breath of glory into this circumstance and, and rekindle that. Let me say to those that, that may be waiting on an easier time uh, to begin serving the Lord, maybe you're home tonight, you know, battling all the medical stuff and the and, and all that's going on in your life, it's awful easy to say it's not worth the struggle. Let me let me encourage you as I encourage these folks. You may never have an easier time than right now to serve the Lord. You're not promised one more day on this earth. The only day that I have to fight my battle is today. Tomorrow may never come. So if I've got something I'm supposed to be doing for the Lord, I need to be doing it today. Amen? I had a preacher friend of mine, I'll, 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 put, I'll put this illustration in your mind and, and challenge you with that. He told me that at the beginning of every year at his church, he put 365 marbles in this big giant jar. And every, every day he'd go into the office and take one of those marbles out of that jar and put it into this one. And he'd watch this whole year with, with adventures and challenges and opportunities. And he'd watch this jar finally just start shrinking and reminding him how many days I've got left this year. How many days have they, 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 uh, the year's almost over. What have I accomplished? He'd watch this jar getting emptier while this other jar's filling up. And he often told me, he would sit and talk with him and say, I got to thinking that I don't know how many days of life I've got left. Well, wouldn't that be something if we viewed our life like that? We've only got so many days left to do. So claim, claim, claim your, with God's help, claim your Canaan. Let's step into 2024. That's the way I started it way back when we first started. Now we're, now we're already into March. Who, who can believe that? I didn't realize how, anyway, I was, I was looking at my calendar and didn't realize how, how anyway, I think it's March already. That's what I'm trying to say. Halfway through March now. There's some great spiritual victories to be known in 2024. Don't give up. Don't quit. Steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know Paul says that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I give you glory and all the praise again for the privilege to bring this good study tonight. I thank you, God, for the attentiveness of those here, Lord, and, and uh, those watching from home. I pray it's been a blessing to them as well. God, I thank you, God, for the powerful truth that come out of this, this troubling story about Aiken, but what a great lesson it teaches all of us. Thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to teach it. Would you go home with us now? Would you protect us as we travel, God, and bring us back here Sunday as we turn our hearts and minds towards Calvary one more time and begin thinking about that crucifixion that's ultimately going to lead to, to his death and, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this holiday season, this Easter season, and for the joy that it brings into our lives. I love you, and I praise you for this privilege. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. And I, every time I read over that, I wonder, why do you think the Lord of God is